you. Well, uh, we're starting a new series uh, on, the, on Corinthians. It's going to be a great series. Of course, Corinthians uh, is, a, is an interesting city. It uh, has a, a port in the north and a port in the south, and so it was, had tons of trade. It sits in the south central part of Greece, and so you have all of these uh, people from all over the world and all of this uh, trading going on. If you want to think of a equivalent city in today's uh, time, it would be like San Francisco, okay, with uh, all of its beauty, all of its diversity, and all of its problems, okay? Uh, Corinth was a problem church, and uh, they got into fights uh, all of the time. You had Jews, Greeks, Romans, and not just uh, Drew, uh, Jews from Jerusalem. You had Jews that were probably coming from uh, uh, Africa and uh, from other parts of the world. And so they had all of these different backgrounds, and it created lots of issues. In fact, they uh, would often fight in some ways like brothers and sisters. Just they're always bickering about something, and Paul's trying to deal with it. Uh, when you think of brothers and sisters uh, fighting, you know why brothers and sisters fight so good with each other? <clears throat> Because they know the right buttons to push, right? Like no one else. Uh, growing up, I always knew, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I, I, know, I know Julie's best button to push. When we were growing up, if I really wanted to dig under her skin, all I had to do was say, uh, you know, sorry, Julie, you're too little. And if, I'm not little, I'm not, and the fight was on, you know, I just, right? And brothers and sisters know how to do that. And in some ways, when you look at the church of Corinth, you just got to know, man, they're like brothers and sisters, and they knew how to push each other's buttons uh, all of the time. And so Paul comes in, and uh, he, he's trying to straighten things out. So when you think of the book of, of Corinthians, uh, first and second, this is very practical. This is about straightening out relationships and helping a church to just be healthy. It's not a book where Paul's uh, trying to lay out deep theological principles. This is about just getting squared up and relating better. So if you want, uh, turn to the first book of Corinthians here, okay? <clears throat> and I feel like I have a, thank you, a frog in my throat. So if, uh, if I go get some water, uh, it's just because I need a drink. <laughs> okay, 1 Corinthians. Um, listen to what he does. And you just got to feel the frustration of Paul. He's trying to deal with this church and they're fighting like brothers and sisters. Um, you know, if you've ever been a parent or grandparent of siblings, then you know how Paul feels when he's writing these words. Look what he says. Look down at verse 10. He says to this, I love this. I appeal to you, he says. And just picture, just picture him in this moment writing this. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, for the love of all that's holy, just get along. It's kind of, kind of what he's uh, saying here. And you know what they were fighting over? You know, now they were fighting over a lot of things. But the first thing he kind of deals, you know what they're fighting over? Baptism. Baptism. And you'd think, you know, what's there to fight over with baptism? You know, unless you've ever been in a church before. And then, you know, you can, we can fight over anything in a church. And they're fighting over baptism. In fact, uh, look down at verse 13. He says this, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you, and here it is, were you baptized into the name of Paul? I can't believe you guys are fighting over who baptized you. This is, and you just feel his frustration. And, and he goes on, he says, uh, and you know, just like, oh, oh man, I am thankful. Look at verse 14. I am thankful that I did not baptize uh, any of you except for Crispus and, and Gaius so that no one can say that you were baptized into my name. And he's frustrated and, and his frustration just comes. I love this. <laughs> this is just, you can totally picture a parent saying this, right? You know, I, I only baptized the two of you. And then look at verse, look at verse 15, or uh, verse uh, 16. Uh, yes, I also baptized the, the household of Stephanus. And just, just go get and then he goes on. Look at this. Beyond that, I don't even remember who else I baptized, but that's not the issue. Who cares who I baptized? You guys are fighting over baptism and you should stop it. <laughs> I just, I love that scripture records some of Paul's frustration. He's so frustrated that we have kind of a parenthesis there. And he's just like, okay, maybe I did baptize someone else, but I don't remember. But just, this isn't the issue, right? And you can just feel Paul. He's like a parent. And he's, you know, in fact, one time uh, Julie and I got into this big fight. I don't even know what it's over. My mom was the only one at home. And she came in and she goes, listen, I can't take it anymore. You guys, and this is in the middle of summer, go outside. Just go outside. And we're like, what? Yeah. If 
you want to fight, fight. Just go outside on the back porch. You're not allowed to be in the house while you're fighting. And Julie, and she kicked us out of the house. And we were both like, wow, mom's really freaking out. What? And we got out there and we, were, and we, just, we stopped fighting. We didn't even know what to do. Mom just kicked us out of the house, ah, you know? And you can just see Paul. Paul's like, guys, you, I can't believe you're doing this. But of course, does Paul expect, does Paul expect that they will stop having disagreements? No. In fact, Paul had uh, lots of disagreements uh, at different moments, right? I mean, disagreements... Um, disagreements are a part of being in community. You can't have a church like this, right, without there being lots of disagreements. We're going to have disagreements. I think there's a deeper issue that Paul is getting to here. In fact, look with me. Um, look back at verse 10. Look what it says in verse 10. This is his, you know, for the love of all that's holy verse here, okay? It says, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with, and I'm going to explain this agree with here in a moment, but you can underline that, agree with, okay? So we've got to understand what he's saying there. That all of you agree with one another so that, now here's the key, so that, now he's going to get to the issue. Here's the, here's the so that phrase, so that there may be no divisions among you. That's the issue. It's the divisions. Now, uh, let, let me walk through this for just a moment. He's saying, I want you to be in agreement with. Agreement with is a relational thing. What he's not trying to say is that you have to be in agreement on. If you take some issue like baptism or whatever it is, he's not saying you all have to agree on this issue. That will never happen. You can't get that to happen in your own family. I can't get that to happen in my own marriage. We, Angie and I had a good fight this uh, last week over the size of the recycling bin that the, the garbage company gave us. I mean, just how stupid is that? I think I was right, but still, it's kind of a crazy <laughs> argument, okay? Um, and, and what Paul is saying is, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not saying you have to be in agreement on an issue, but you need to be in agreement with one another. And there's a difference between being in agreement with and being in agreement on. See, um, you, you can be in agreement with and not agree on the issue. You can have different opinions, different thoughts, different ways that you think uh, something uh, should be handled and still be in agreement with. Because when you're not in agreement with, that starts to create divisions. That's Paul's concern here, okay? Okay. Very important. That's why I said underline agreement with. He's talking about a relational thing here. Let me give you this illustration. Uh, back in high school, uh, we had a, a very infamous game in which the game started off and a couple of our linemen, this is in football, and if you went to Miranda High School in the 80s, you might remember this game. Um, a couple of our linemen uh, kind of got fed up with our quarterback at this point. Didn't like how he was running the offense. Didn't like the calls he was making. And, and started, you know, yakking. But, you know, that happens, right? There are going to be football games today in which the offensive line isn't going to like how the quarterback is calling the game. Not going to like how they're running the offense, right? That happens in all sports. Teammates may have disagreements with how another teammate is playing the game, playing the sport. That's one thing. But uh, a couple of our linemen started, you know, yakking with talking with the other lineman. I didn't like that call. What do you think? Of? Why did he, he threw it to that guy and he should have thrown it to that guy. And it wasn't long before, and I can't remember at what point in the game, but somewhere in the game, uh, the linemen had kind of had it and they'd been yakking with each other. Uh, they line up, the quarterback comes up behind the center, says, hike. And at that moment, every lineman on our team turned sideways, sucked in their gut and became as thin as possible. They, came, they became the offensive line of the door, I think. <laughs> they, they were more door-like than wall-like at that moment. And I kid you not, it was like hike and just poof, poof, and our quarterback got s just smashed into oblivion. It was an all-out race by the defense to see who could get there to crush our quarterback faster. Now, here's my point. In that moment, they went from being a team that, did, that weren't in agreement on something, how the quarterback was running the offense, to a team that suddenly was not in agreement with each other, okay? And here's the difference. On that play, they were no longer teammates. See the difference? And Paul is saying, 
Guys, you're going to have disagreements. But you have to remain teammates. You have to be in agreement with each other. And so there's a great lesson here, I think, for, for me, for you as a church, because we're always going to have disagreements on an issue. But Paul is saying, but I want you to stay in agreement with each other. You have to stay teammates, okay? Now, this plays itself out in a church in uh, two different ways. It plays itself out in a corporate way, right? In a corporate sense, uh, there may be some church issue, right? And churches over the ages have fought over all kinds of things, right? You can, you can fight over baptism, you know? I mean, churches, we've, churches have fought over baptism for years. You can fight over the, you know, the kind of music we're going to worship to. We can fight over the kinds of sermons. You know, the sermons, they're, they're not deep enough or they're not rele- uh, relevant enough. We can fight over how missions dollars are spent. We can fight. There are, there are renowned f- church splits over over the color of the hymnals in which in, if you're in the chapel service you have hymnals but here we don't even have hymnals so we tried to do away with that fight right um, you can fight over theological issues you can fight over procedural issues but oftentimes there's a kind of corporate issue within a church now here's what happens when it goes wrong uh, there will be people or a person or one of us and we'll start to talk we'll we'll see that issue and we'll not like Uh, what uh, the leadership is doing on that issue or what one side within the church is doing or lobbying for and we begin the talk we begin the talk and 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 we start chattering about and here's and this is the issue look back uh, here look at uh, uh, look down at verse where did it go verse 12 look at verse 12 Paul's going to explain this here's what he says look at this verse 12 what I mean is this and underline this What I mean is this, one of you says, one of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, it's the talk. Paul is saying, here's the problem. The way you talk about this matters. When you have a disagreement on an issue, the way you talk matters. Because here's how it plays out in a corporate sense. Uh, People like, you know, we start talking to someone else and we're soliciting people to come to our side on the issue. We're soliciting people to be in agreement with us on that issue. We're consolidating opinions and support about how we want things to run. But friends, that's so unhealthy. What Paul is saying, you can't talk that way. Because it feels good to consolidate that support, to find other people that are like-minded as you are on that issue, or to kind of win them over to your opinion. That feels good for us. But Paul is saying, you know what happens when you do that? Is you consolidate people through your talk to you. You're pulling them way away from somebody else. You're creating a division on this issue within the church. And that's the part that's not okay. Friends, that's deadly to a church because what it does is it, is it puts the person being talked to in that moment. When if, if I go out and I start having that talk inappropriately, I force someone to choose between teammates and that's a division. Now, now we, we're not having agreement with. And Paul said, you, you can't do that. You can't talk that way. You can't solicit support in that way to your issue, see? Now, it works itself out in a similar fashion, uh, in a different way, and that is at a personal level, right? Uh, This issue Paul talks about can be applied to corporate issues, church issues, you know, the church music or whatever. How, you know, how loud are we going to turn up the drums? One of those things. Or it can work itself out a personal issue. Someone says something that hurts your feelings, does something that hurts your feelings. There's someone that you feel insecure around, someone that I, I struggle with or I don't like their opinion on something. And now it's a personal issue. It's something between me and somebody else. And what Paul is saying here is you got to be careful about the talk. If there's an issue between you and a sister or brother that, that, you know, that we have, I can't go over and start talking to other people. And here's the temptation. That feels so good. I want to be validated 
in my, on my side of the issue. I was the one wounded. I'm the one that's right on this issue. And I want to talk because it, it's validating to what I feel or believe. But here's what I do. When I do that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to one of my teammates and I'm putting them in the awful position of having to choose between me or one of their other teammates. See, when I talk that way, what I do is I put that person in the awful position of, of if they push back on me, then it's like they're being disloyal to me as a team. I put them in that spot. But if, I, but if they feel drawn to me because they, they, they you know, gosh, I've got this person in there hurting and they're upset about it, and I draw them to me, I've drawn them away from somebody else. And it creates a division. And what Paul is saying is, that's the problem. You can be in a disagreement on something. But you need to be in agreement with one another. You've got to stay teammates. Make sense? See what he's saying? So, um, as we think about this, uh, what do we do? And this is what I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about here. What do we do when we have a problem with someone or we have a problem on some issue in the church where we're the ones and we're saying, I'm struggling with this because there's an, there's an issue that I'm in disagreement with. What do we do? Uh, let me give you some advice uh, on that. The first thing is this. and Actually, let me take a drink here. I'm about ready to cough. <clears throat> the first thing is this. We need to talk to the right person or persons, right? That's the first thing. That talk is deadly when we talk to the wrong person. And who's the right person to talk to? The person that we're in disagreement with on the issue. That's the person you talk to. Isn't it interesting? Paul gives us a great illustration of this right here. Isn't it interesting? You know, Paul has got a problem with the church at Corinth. He's got a lot. We're going to find this out. He's got a lot of problems with this church. And you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't write a letter to the church at Ephesus telling them about the Corinthians. He doesn't write this big old long letter to the, the church at Ephesus and say, oh my gosh, the Corinthians, they're off on this whole weird baptism thing and they're, they're frustrating me and they don't think I'm as polished a speaker as I should be. And, I, and see, if he did that, can you imagine how he could solicit some support and validation from some other churches that he started? I mean, they'd be like, oh, Paul, you're a great speaker. Oh, Paul, I can't believe that. He could do that. But you know what he'd do? He'd start creating a division within the, the, the church, the first century church. He doesn't do that. Who does he write his letter to? The Corinthians. Because they're the people he's got an issue with. And so it starts with speaking to the person that we have an issue with. The healthy place to go is to the person we have a disagreement with. Now, second thing here. And this is really important. If you're going to go talk to that person that you have a disagreement with, um, is this. We must let go of our expectations. You can go and talk to them. That's a good thing. But remember, you can't take many expectations in them. You can't expect them. You can't expect to just have a conversation with them and it all be better, that they're going to agree with you, that there's some issue that they have and that you're going to go and talk with them and then suddenly they're going to go, oh, I see it your way. I'm in total agreement with you. Ha <laughs> ha. I'd be nice. Might happen. Probably won't. Okay. But if you go into it with that expectation, understand this, and I'll explain it more in a moment, but you put yourself in, the, in a one-down position that is unhealthy in that. Don't go with those expectations. You can't go into it with an expectation that, okay, this person hurt me. They did something that hurt me. So I'm going to go into this conversation with the expectation that they will find newfound empathy and that they, that they will... That they will uh, empathize with my pain and that they will they, that they'll somehow be sorry and remorseful in a way that matches the pain that they've caused to me that'd be nice that'd be really nice uh, but there's a good chance that's not going to happen don't go into it with that expectation because if you go into it with the expectation that they will have a newfound empathy that matches the pain that you have felt from them You've put yourself in a one-down position. Here's what I mean by that one-down position. You go into a conversation <clears throat> with an expectation or a desire of something. 
you have no control over. You don't have control over how that other person will think about that issue. You don't have control over, over whether or not that person will feel as sorry as you think they should feel over hurting you. And if you go into that wanting control, having an expectation on something you don't have control over, friends, you're setting yourself up to not meet that expectation and get hurt all the more. So when you have those conversations, that conversation is about the conversation itself. It is about saying, I have an issue with you. I just need to tell you. Express. We need to have a conversation so that we can stay in agreement with one another so that you know I'm not going behind your back and soliciting support for me and against you. And so we've just got to talk about it. You've got to go into those conversations with the right expectation. The key, the key, and read through the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. The key of what this is all about, what Paul is doing is saying you've got to move forward. Have the conversation. Don't go into the conversation with wrong expectations. The point here is, is that you've got to move past the issue that you're in disagreement with. You've got to just let it be sometimes. Sometimes you need to have the conversation about an issue, say your piece, and just acknowledge. We're not going to agree with one another, but that's okay. That's okay. We'll stay in agreement with each other, even though we're not in agreement on, the, on this issue that's, that's there. Okay, now, how, how do we move forward? Let me talk about that a little bit uh, here in all of this. Um, uh, let me, let me I've, I've got time. Let me, let me bring out this point. The key to that is to focus on Christ who, you, who unites us. Christ is our uniter in this. In fact, uh, look with me back to 1 Corinthians. And, and again, this is part of Paul pushing them forward, saying you've got you've to move forward. You know what else is interesting? And flip back to 1 Corinthians, let me tell you this. You know what else is interesting? Paul never, never resolves the, this baptism issue. He never says, here's my, I'm rendering my opinion, my verdict on the baptism issue. He just lets it lay there. Because that's not the issue. His issue is not their disagreement on something. His issue is that you, you're no longer in agreement with each other. And so you've got to move on. You're not going to resolve the baptism issue. You've got to move on. And what do you move on to? That we're all united with Christ. Look what he does here. Look at verse uh, 2. He starts it off this way. He says, To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy. <laughs> and you just, he's writing this and going, Oh my gosh, they are so far from being holy. But at least they're called to be holy, right? That's God's gonna, you know, God, God's gonna help them get there someday, right? To those called to be holy, together with, and look at this, together with all, with all those everywhere. He's trying to even say, you know what? Not only are you not united in Christ here at this church, you have teammates, you have fellow followers of Christ all over the place. This is a movement that's gonna grow global. And we, we are brothers and sisters in Christ all over the place, right? Who, look at this, who called on the name of who? Of Jesus Christ, see? Uh, look at uh, verse nine, he says this, God, who has called you into fellowship, see, this is in agreement with, fellowship with who? His son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Look down at verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've read that verse already. And then look at verse 13. He, and I love this question. Is Christ divided? Well, of course not. Christ is not divided. So neither should we. We are united. Just as Christ is united, we are united in Christ. Okay? So when you have to move on, part of moving on is to say, I may not agree with them in this issue, but I am united with them and that they are my brother or my sister in Christ. Now, let me give you a really powerful word that will be very helpful in living this out. My next point here, I wanna give you a word that will help you live out this thing of how to move forward in a practical way with being united with one another in Christ, even when you have a disagreement on an issue, okay? You curious what the word is? Simple, you're, you're, you'll never guess this word. You know what the word is? Enough. 
enough uh, is such a powerful uh, word here. In fact, look with me. Uh, look at uh, verse 4. Look at verse 4. <clears throat> it says, I always thank God for you because of, and underline this, because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. Powerful verse. That, that, you know what that verse is saying in really practical terms? Enough. Christ is enough. The grace of Jesus Christ is enough. So uh, when you find yourself in that spot where you're tempted to talk to somebody else because somebody's driving you crazy, they've hurt your feelings or they believe something that you think is just outlandish and you think they need to be doing something else and you're tempted to go the wrong direction, you know what we need to do? We need to just have that conversation with them, right? Go to them and say, you know, here's, I, I see this differently than you and I just gotta tell you this or you hurt me and I need to tell you this and then you say, but they don't get it. You've gotta say, you know what? It was enough to talk with them. That was enough. In, in the grace of Jesus Christ, that was enough. Um, maybe they hurt you and you feel like, you know, their remorse, their remorse doesn't match my pain. And so I, I you know, I'm going to go over here and talk with them. You know, they're not very sorry about it. Don't do that. You've got to say, you know what? The remorse that they did have was enough. It's enough to go, to go and just talk with them. You don't need to solicit support. You don't need to get that validation. It's enough to just have that conversation with them. You know, years ago, Roger uh, laid out a really good principle uh, on sorry. <clears throat> you may remember this years ago. He said, you know, if you've wounded someone and you go to them to say sorry to them, um, he said, make sure your sorry is as big as the hurt that you caused, right? He said, you know, if you've hurt them this much, don't say sorry this much. Great principle when you're the person going to say sorry, okay, when you're the offender. But if you're the offendee, this principle does not work in reverse. You can't uh, go to someone who's hurt you and say, man, you hurt me this much. So we're going to have a little talk about the issue. And I'm expecting that your sorry is going to be this big because this is my hurt. You can't do that. You can't do that. If their sorry is only this big, you've got to say, it's enough. In the grace of Jesus Christ, it's enough. Here's why. Here's why. The closer that person is to you, a child, a parent, a spouse, the less likely you are to ever feel like their sorry will match your pain. I, and I just, as a pastor, I'm telling you, I have seen this thousands of times. The closer you are to someone, the the, the the broader and the deeper the pain feels. And so if you have a close friend or a spouse or a, a, someone in your family who's hurt you and, and you go to them and you say, you hurt me, and if you expect them to ever give you an apology that will be as big as your pain, I'm here to tell you that probably won't happen because it's deep. We feel, and you know what you've got to do? Whatever their sorry is, you've got to say that's enough. In the grace of Jesus Christ, that is enough. And I'm going to move forward. It's enough. And if you can begin to see that the grace of Jesus Christ empowers you to be okay with whatever happens out there and say this is enough, then friends, you're put in the absolute best position to move forward in Christ. Now, um, uh, let me give you, let me give you, and you know what? Here's the other thing too. Let me just apply that enough to one more principle here. I'm looking at the time. Um, one more principle with that. If you're the offender and someone comes to you and they say, you know, you hurt me and all of a sudden you, you're overwhelmed with remorse and you go, oh my gosh, I have hurt this person so bad. And you live out Roger's principle, right? Okay, you ask him questions. Man, I see, I hurt you this much. Man, I get it. And then you say an apology as best you can that is like this much that matches up. Here's what might happen. The person that came to you and you say that sorry back to them, there's a good chance that they will look at your apology and go, oh my gosh, it was this big. I'm hurting this much and you came back with this. 
And there's a chance you're going to walk away with this kind of guilt that just says, oh man, I'm trying to say sorry and I can't believe I did that. And Because that happens. When we have these conversations, there are going to be some healthy moments where we do come to the place where we say, man, I didn't mean to hurt that person. I was a jerk or I just, I saw it differently or I wouldn't do that the same, but I hurt them. And you say sorry and your sorry is not good enough. You know what? By the grace of Jesus Christ, what you did You've got to say, it's enough. It's enough. Even if that person won't accept it, you do something very good for our community when you say, you know, I am sorry. I did my best to apologize. And even though it wasn't enough for that person, it's enough in the grace of Jesus Christ. Do you see how if we can get to this place, we become healthier? Now, let me, let me give you the secret power just real quickly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm going to spend no time on this, okay? I'll come back and do it in another sermon. It's so good. It's the secret behind, the, the great power behind enough, why it works. I'll just tantalize you with that. And hopefully before the series is over, I'll come back and talk about it. Uh, <clears throat> it's really good, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, but l- let me end with this because we're about out. Of time. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. I want us to end with the Lord's Supper because everything that Paul points to here in this moment is... Man, you may not have agreement on an issue, but you can be in agreement with one another because we are all in Christ. We all operate under the grace of Jesus Christ. And so we have to unify ourselves around whose we are. And, you know, in some ways, maybe there's, there's just, there's not a better uh, picture of that than the Lord's Supper. We come together together And we celebrate the Lord's Supper together as brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. That God is our Father because of the work that Jesus Christ did. And so whatever our shortcomings are, you know, we've got our shortcomings. You know, I'm going to poke, and so is Jack, we're going to poke a lot of fun at the the church in Corinth because it's easy to do with the church in Corinth. But you know what? We have our issues. We're not perfect. I'm so far from perfect. I can fight over recycling bins, okay? but I am united with Angie in Jesus Christ because of the work that Christ did on the cross. And before she was ever my spouse, Angie was my sister in Christ. And you, you are my brothers and sisters in Christ. And you are one another's brothers and sisters in Christ. And there's something magnificent about just embracing that fact that in the grace of Christ, we get to become brothers and sisters. We're going to fight a lot. But nothing should ever divide us. So with that, let's celebrate communion here this morning. So I'm going to ask uh, that the ushers come and pass the bread.